How's it going, Justin? It's uh, great to finally get you on the podcast. We've definitely been working on planning this thing for quite a while now, so I'm really excited for our conversation. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so Justin, I, I start everyone off uh, with giving their background, right? Uh, like how you got into IT, how you got into security, that sort of thing. And the reason why I do that is because there's a portion of my audience that could be getting into security for the very first time or trying to get into IT for the first time. And I think it's always helpful to hear everyone's story and maybe it'll match up with someone and they can say, oh, if if he did it, maybe it's possible for me. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, definitely. I can give you a little bit of background on how I kind of got to where I am today. So um, after I graduated college, I moved to New York City and I started working. I, I had a, I had a degree. I wanted to work in technology. And I started working for a company here in New York that did software licensing. This was back in, not to age myself, back in 2002, um, where we were selling a lot of Microsoft licensing to big businesses. So I got a lot of exposure to IT and to a lot of large businesses, primarily based here in New York the IT departments and how they work and how they operate. And, and so I did that for a few years. And then I actually um, left that job for a small period of time where I, I went to go work in film because I lived in New York City and I was young and I wanted to come a job at the, at the school at that point in time. Um, so I left to go work in film for a while, which was great too. And I think back on how it all kind of played together with where I am today, because I learned a lot of things about like my work ethic. And when you work for a film company in New York City, there's a million people ready to take their job. So you always kind of have to be on your A game all the time. Um, and it also, um, by working in film, I was surrounded by a lot of different celebrities and really people that I viewed at that point in my life as being like really prestigious, important people. And it, I realized by working with them that they're just people like me and there's no reason why I should idolize them. And so that helped me when I started Remedic as well, because that gave me confidence to be able to do that. Um, but I ended up working in film for a few years and then I really decided that it started to get a little bit older and I was like, Hey, you know, maybe I don't really care so much about having the cool job in New York city. Uh, I care more about something that I'm going to be good at. And so I, I left, um, film. I also didn't want to move to Los Angeles, which was kind of the next logical step for me if I stayed in film. So I, I left film and I went back and I worked, um, for some consulting companies here in New York, um, doing consulting work, tech consulting work. And one of um, the companies that I worked for, uh, I ended up doing a large penetration test. Um, I was I was primarily providing so, uh, cybersecurity services through these other um, consulting companies that I was working with. And I ended up doing a, a penetration test for a large prestigious uh, law firm here in New York City. And we did a really good job working with them. We were able to hack them a bunch of different ways, which was uh, good for us. I don't know if that was necessarily good for them, but it was good for us. And, um, they were, they, their CIO at that, that point in time was pretty impressed with the work that we did. And so he had asked me, he, cause I, I had a longstanding relationship with this law firm through just my various years of working in IT in, in New York. And, uh, he had told me that he knows that I wanted to start my own business, um, and that I wanted to start my own cybersecurity firm because I had talked to him about it before. And he said that he's happy to refer me because of the good work we did for them. He's happy to refer me into one of their customers, but the only way he's going to do that is if I start my own business. And so he kind of allowed me to start my own business. Uh, turns out they ended up referring me into one of their clients. Keep in mind, this is a really prestigious New York City based law firm. So their clients are also very prestigious type of customers as well. Um, they referred me into one of the, I, I, for NDA reasons, I obviously can't tell you who the customer is, but they referred me into a really prestigious kind of wealth management company. Um, and we ended up doing a pen test for them as well. Um, and then we had them a bunch of different ways as well. And that, slowly kind of snowballed into working with a lot of high network type of companies uh, here in New York City. Um, so from really 2015 to like 2017, 18, we were really just doing kind of pen testing work for high net worth type of companies. Um, and then I wanted to really kind of even out my workflow and I wanted to provide security services to smaller companies because I could relate to them more, frankly. I'm, I'm still consider myself a startup, but I was a startup definitely at that point in time. And so I wanted to work with SaaS based companies because I just kind of thought of that as being the future of technology. It was cool doing these big pen tests, but we were working on a lot of legacy tech. And so I wanted to work with more innovative new cloud based tech. And so I started working with a lot of startups. I realized there was a huge hole in the market um, for people that had security expertise, especially in the cloud space at this point in time. 
And so I realized there was a huge opportunity for me to capitalize on that and to really kind of build out a whole lot of services around cloud security. And that was, when I started to do that was in like 2017. We had like 20 clients and, and now we have over 600. So it's been, it's been I, th- I think I made the right decision. We've had some pretty rapid growth since then. Man, that's that's really fascinating. There's a lot to unpack there. You know, uh, it's interesting you bring up film. I've actually never had anyone on that went to the film industry and then into back into IT or, you know, into IT in any capacity. Right. Um, my a cousin of mine, he uh, he actually did some work on, in film in L.A., and, uh, you know, he worked on Thor, worked on the Spider-Man movies and a couple other, you know, movies. And uh, it, it was all with Disney. And he said that he'll never work for Disney again. <laughs> so he, <laughs> no, he decided to, yeah, he, he said he said he decided to move to Pittsburgh and teach uh, theater after that. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, I think. Like I said, I think when I, when I decided to work in film, again, I live in New York City. I was in my 20s at that point in time. And I think my priorities were just a little bit different. I, I wasn't, I didn't go to school for film. It wasn't like I was a, planning on being a filmmaker. Or doc, like I love documentaries, but I never had the desire to really make them. Um, I did it for the wrong reasons. I did it because I wanted to be surrounded by cool people. Because all my friends had cool jobs and I wanted a cool mm. job too. And selling like yourself licensing isn't necessarily the coolest job. So, uh, yeah, I went into it for that reason. And then I worked there for a while. And, and, and like I said, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about work ethic. It, ta- it taught me, it boosted my confidence to be around these people and realize that they're people who I once idolized, but they're really just now, they're just people like me and you and everyone else. Um, and so I think like I did take a lot from working in film and I was able to leverage that and apply that to how I do work now at Remedic. Um, being the CEO of this company, I don't know that I would have had the confidence to necessarily start this company had I not worked in film and put myself in those situations or really even have the confidence to always go up to a lot of, we work with a lot of other companies, big companies. We work partner with some startups and some bigger companies to, to meet with the executives of these companies and, and deliver my message with confidence. I don't know that I would have been able to do that had I not had that experience in film because it really taught me that like people are just people, no matter mm. what their title or, what whatever they are they're all we're all people we all have insecurities we all have, have like the same thing going on in our lives typically yeah it's um you know having I, I don't know if that is necessarily like imposter syndrome or you know just anxiety with talking to someone that you see you know as beyond you or whatever it is um, I, I remember when I started this podcast, you know, I, I was talking to a friend. I'm like, I have no business talking to, you know, these CEOs and these founders and these guys that, you know, hack airplanes midair with them on it. Like, I have no business talking to these people. Like, how am I even going to, you know, do this conversation? Like, I, it was a, I was talking to the CISO of some large company, you know, and my friend just kind of broke it down to really simple terms. He's like, well, you know, when he gets hurt, do you think he like bleeds another color or is it red like you, you know, is he, is he from this planet, you know? And, you know, obviously all of those questions are yes. And, uh, he's like, well, then you have nothing to worry about. He's just another person, you know, he like, he has a journey just like you. Um, and you just have to remember that you're just two people having a conversation. And, uh, I, I think that that, that skill, you know, really helped me going forward. Right. Because now I feel like I can honestly, you know, talk to anyone, have a conversation with with anyone. It doesn't matter what industry they're in or, you know, their expertise or anything like that. And, you know, obviously that helps me with the podcast, but it helps me overall. Right. Because when I go into, you know, interviews or I meet new people at conferences or whatever, you know, it's a lot it's a lot easier, in in my opinion, to have those conversations. I, I, I feel like I'm a little bit more pleasant to talk to after that. For sure. I think it, it helps me deliver my message with confidence because I don't second guess myself as much. I know what, as long as I know what I'm talking about, I'm, I'll be articulate about it and I'll deliver it with clarity and, and with confidence. And I think that that's something that I got from being around these people, again, who I once idolized and realizing that, like, Oh, they are just like me. And some mm. of them probably have 
more insecurities than me or just everyone has their own issues. And so like, why should I, why should I view them any differently? And it, it really, it really, I think, I, I mean, obviously a lot of working in the tech and all that stuff that I've done and technology really kind of helped to get me here and gave me sort of the technological skills to be able to do what I do today. Um, but I think that it's a good thing that I did work in film because it definitely gave me the ability to communicate well and have confidence going into most of the interactions and engagements that I do now as the CEO of a, of a company. Hmm. <clears throat> so when you were doing pen tests uh, for, you know, these, these very powerful customers, you know, I mean, I, I guess that's probably a good way of saying it. And I've actually worked on the other end of that where I worked for a large wealth management firm um, here. In, I, here in Chicago, I mean, everyone knows I'm in Chicago now, so they can they can go Google it. But um, you know, it was interesting how we approached pen tests and how we kind of tried to influence like the opinion of the pen tester and things like that. And you know, yeah, you you know, me personally, I feel I was very uncomfortable being in that room. Right. Because I, I am not someone who's going to tell the pen tester, oh, you should look over here and not here. Right. Or you should, you know, try and authenticate via this method and not this. I'm, that's not my job. Right. Like it's the pen tester's job to get in. It's not my job to tell them where to look. You, I mean, you if know, they got in, then obviously they were doing something right. So you don't need to tell them how to do it if they were able to get in. Well, that that's, that's, part of the problem, right? So our firm would put so many restrictions around them that they wouldn't be able to get in. So then we could say, you know, in some report, a clean report. Oh, yeah. we passed it, you know, but I'm over here and I'm like, yeah, I can tell that into the core switch in our network. <laughs> like you cannot tell me that that is secure. You can't tell mm -hmm. me our network is secure. If I can just tell that, right in no authentication and I, oh i now have root like now i have root and i can do whatever i want but i'm not a network guy so i can't even you know i, I don't know the cisco syntax or anything like that right um did you ever come across something like that where you know people were trying to somehow influence the results of the pen test or influence how you approached it and how did you how did you approach that situation? Because I feel like as a security professional, right, you're kind of, it's like you're tied to these industry standards where you absolutely shouldn't do that. But it's, it's, it's a, it's a war internally, right. Between you and the organization to be like, to, to kind of thread the needle, so to speak. Right. Because the org may want it a certain way. And then you may know you need it another way. Right. So how do you, how do you balance that if you've encountered that? I think it's about having clear communication with what you're going to be doing and what the expectations are of the people that you're going to be testing. So if they're going to gray box it and keep it very limited scope, then fine, we'll have that communication with them. But we need to be clear about like, hey, if we were a malicious adversary or a hacker, that was, they're not going to only focus on this tiny scope. They're going to focus on your entire platform. So... Um, I don't know if this is the best phrase, but it's something I always tell people is no one likes to hear that their baby is ugly. So no one wants to think like, oh, we built this program and we thought it was great. And then we just had a company come in and hack it a bunch of different ways and show us all the holes in it. Um, and I think that that's always, it, it, that conversation changes on depending on what level of person you're talking to within the organization. If you're speaking to a security engineer who's responsible for essentially building and maintaining that security program, he may have a much different reaction than a CISO or someone that understands that if you do get hacked and you do actually, there's a, a loss of data or there's a breach or something like that, understands the how the repercussions for that can be pretty detrimental. Um, the conversation switches. So if you're speaking to an executive, they're going to understand and kind of empathize with you. They're going to say, yes, thank you for finding this. Like, like it happened with that large law firm. There's the security engineering team after we left, um, probably didn't have a very good conversation with their management team, but the management team from that law firm, because we did such a good job, ended up referring us into another really prestigious client. So. Um, I think when you, when you're talking about how to kind of frame it, there's two ways. When you, when you go to scope something out, you have to be very clear about like what the scope is and, and 
how and, and what they want you to look for. And then if, if it's just a pointed part of this, you have to be very clear that says, fine, we're happy to do that. Um, however, like you should know that your entire tax surface is at risk. It's not just this one tiny part. Um, and so if you can clearly communicate that to them and they still want you to focus on just a small part to get a clean report or whatever their logic is for that, we'll do that. But we've done our due diligence and, and we've done our, we've done well by telling them what the actual risk is. Um, and then when you deliver the report results, especially if it's something where we've kind of been able to hack them a bunch of different ways, um, we, we typically just are very open and honest about it. We go back and we show them. We're willing to show them. One of the things that we do when we pen test is we all of our pen testers are based here in the U.S. And we actually open up, we'll set up like a Slack channel or Microsoft Teams channel or whatever. Um, and as we're doing a pen test, we're talking to the engineers, telling them, this is what we found. This is how we found it. So they don't just wait for the report and then it's not a surprise when they get it. So I think that softens the blow a little bit and they understand the process a little more. So it's a little bit easier for us to justify it when we're delivering that report in a week or two or whenever we have a meeting. We also typically give our customers a two-week window to do any remediations. So they can remediate within that two-week window anything that we found. And then we will issue not another report, but we'll issue an attestation letter to that report that says, hey, these were these vulnerabilities that were discovered on as reflected in the report data, whatever the data is. Um, we went back and retested those as of this date, which again was never longer than two weeks, and they were all remediated and are no longer found as a threat. So there are some ways that you can kind of help out the security team by giving them that window as long as they're doing their, uh, doing good work by getting everything remediated and doing what they need to do. We're happy to kind of go back and attest to the fact that they put in the effort to fix these problems. Mm. You know, do you think that you ever would have started the company if that exec, you know, didn't push you towards it, right? And kind of show you like, hey, there's another customer here. You know, you could start this company for, I don't know, thousand bucks, right? And you can make, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just throwing oh, out, you know, yeah. yeah. I think they knew that I was going to start my own company regardless. And I think that because we did, because I had talked to them and again, I'd been, this is a law firm I used to sell Microsoft licensing to back in 2002. So I'd known these mm. guys for years. And so um, I think that the fact that they knew that I wanted to do this and the fact that they, that I did such a, a great job on their pen test, they were looking to kind of be like, Hey, we know Justin does good work. We know that he did this. Like we know that he wants to start his own company. Let's help him by giving him like a platform to kick off and by giving them me ultimately one of the most, what I would consider still this day our most prestigious client, but um, one of their best clients too, uh, to do good work by them that they, they definitely sped up the process because I remember when they told me and I had to go home and make a website and get all my contracts together and make a matter of weeks. Um, that I, they, they sped up the process, but I, I think it's something that I would have done. Actually, I know it's something I would have done regardless. I probably just wouldn't have had that, that helping hand. Hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, when you start going down that path of like founding a company and going, it, it's a totally different stress, you know, like, uh, I mean, for me, I, I guess it's a lot less stress, right? Because I'm not dependent on the success of the company, you know, to pay my mortgage. Right. Um, but it's a different kind of stress in terms of, you know, kind of knowing or, or defeating that impersonation, impersonation syndrome. Right. Because um, now you're starting the company and you're the expert, right. By, by default, you're saying you're the expert in this space, whatever it might be. Um, you know, did you face any of that when you started the company or did you already kind of move past that, you know, with your, your previous endeavors? So a little bit of both, I guess, um, to answer your question. So I think when I first started this company, I, I mean, I knew a lot about the industry still and I knew what I was doing. Um, I think one of the things that people get hung up on though, is they, if you are the CEO of a cybersecurity company and someone asks you a question, uh, you have to be truthful. If you don't know the answer to that question, say, hey, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm going to do some research or I'm going to ask around it and I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to get you an answer and then follow through on that. And then people will actually respect you more when you do that because they're going to say, hey, like, 
not always do people follow up. Sometimes people will just give a half kind of witted answer so that they can sound like they know what they're talking about. I think a lot of times people can see through that. So I didn't know everything from the start, but I recognized I didn't know everything from the start and I was never going to be dishonest to my customers. So I was always honest with them. Um, as the cloud security space started to evolve more and more, and I would meet with other executives or I would go out to Silicon Valley and I'd meet with like these founders of like these well-funded kind of like security security companies. And I would meet with them. And then I realized there was a point in time where I was like, I actually am the subject matter expert here. Like I know what I'm talking. These people are coming to me rather than me going to them. And this is someone kind of like what I said with film, someone who I would have idolized before in this industry or I would have thought of as being a subject matter expert. And they're actually coming to me as the subject matter expert on this. And so there was really a point in time where that switched. So did I have imposter syndrome? I didn't because I was always honest with my customers, right? I never tried to make them think that I knew something that I didn't. But I was honest and told them when they didn't know something and I was following up on that. And then there was just a point in time where I realized that like, I do actually, from doing this for so long and how i have going on 10 years of running this company, that I actually am the subject matter expert and I don't need to think of other people as being that. And I certainly don't feel any sort of imposter syndrome anymore. Hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting how being honest with your customers can really alleviate a lot of that, a lot of that stress. You know, I feel like it's very easy to get into a mentality of you have to, you know, uphold some, some type of image or whatever it is. And I remember when I first started, you know, my consulting LLC and um, I had a customer that was asking me, you know, about my experience around a certain, you know, project that they had going on and things like that. And I told them very honestly, like, hey, I know what you're talking about and everything, but I'm not the right person to actually deploy, you know, that that portion of the technology. I understand it 100 percent. I just don't have the technical expertise to actually do it because it's very code heavy. I'm not a developer to save my life. You know, like there's other people out there that can do this a whole lot better than what I can give you. And I fully expected them to not, you know, give me the contract to not accept the the deal or anything like that. And for some reason they accepted it. And even after accepting it, I told them like, Hey, you know, I am probably not the guy, you know, um, and it it alleviated a lot of the stress um, just being up front with them, you know, and, and come to find out their requirements were a little bit different. It's a little bit lighter than what they were actually telling me, you know, and when we did the discovery session, we were able to hash all of that out. But, you know, I've always found it valuable to be very upfront. Right. And even, you know, today, my nine to five, I'm very upfront with what my my limitations are in the, in the space, right? Because not everyone is going to be able to, you know, work in, in the cloud a hundred percent with all of the different services that, you know, AWS launches in a year, right? Like I think last year they lost, they launched something like 40 services. How can anyone keep up with that? You can't, it's impossible. And so I think the pressure that people feel to try to portray that they're a complete subject matter expert on all of this is irrelevant. And I think that when I look at when I hire people or when I'm working with like, I I appreciate a level of vulnerability and honesty. Because then again, I would always go to my customers and say, Hey, I don't know that, but I will find out and I will come back to you. And then I would would I would research it or I'd ask around and I would get the right answer and then I'd come back to them. And then they would know that I was being honest with them because I wouldn't have wasted all that time to figure out something and then come back to them with something that wasn't true. and so I, I find that like you just showing a little bit, again, kind of going back to the thing I learned in, in film, which is that we're all human. We all have vulnerabilities. Like we're all vulnerable to something. And showing that you're human, but then showing that you're an honest human that cares about their best interests, which is, which is what people will really appreciate more than you trying to sound like you know what you're talking about, but it comes across as uh, disingenuous. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. So, you know, you 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 brought up previously how you identified SaaS as being, you know, kind of the future at that point in time and whatnot. Are you still 
looking at the industry and you know actively looking at where it's going and if you are which i would totally assume that you are you know where do you think it's going where are those new security domains and and areas going that people should be paying attention to in the next five years so if you are a SaaS based company which means you've probably started a company relatively recently and you're not um 10 or 20 15 years old um, I think obviously you're going to be the majority of your data or whatever will be based in the cloud. You'll be a SaaS based company. I think a lot of companies that are going to be inputting data from their end users are going to need to adhere to some sort of um, compliance standards. I think that the industry is shifting quickly with a lot of compliance platforms that are coming up and automating a big portion of uh, what needs to be a, of the compliance and controls, p- policies, and procedures. So I think that's a big piece in the industry. You look at companies like Vanta that are out there right now, and they're really killing it because they're automating this piece. Um, so I think that is a big piece of it. I love um, everyone wants to talk about AI, right? It's the biggest buzzword right now. I'm pretty sure if you just mention AI in Silicon Valley, you'll find some mm-hmm. investors that are willing to give you millions of dollars. And even business um, AI is going to be a threat. But I don't. Again, I feel like everyone wants to talk about it because they want to feel like they're on, they understand it. But I don't. We don't know what those threats are going to be yet. We don't know how it's going to evolve. Um, the only thing that I would say about AI is really, I'm sure the threats will evolve with AI, but so will our defenses. That's just the continual kind of way that we've continued to grow, and the cybersecurity industry has grown. Is as threats evolve, so do the defenses. Um, they may be grow much quicker with AI. That's yet to be determined. Um, but I think the defenses will continue to grow. Um, but outside of that, I mean, I don't know. Are we going to have chatbot hackers? Maybe, but I, I think no one really can answer that question definitively. And so whenever anyone tries to, I kind of smirk because I don't think anyone really actually knows. I think they just want to think that they know. Um, but yeah, so I mean, how AI progresses is going to be a big piece of it. Really, and just overall cloud security. I think there's a huge, like I I said back when I kind of focused on primarily cloud-based architecture in 2017, I viewed that as being the future of technology. Um, I don't meet a lot of companies that are starting up today that are inputting a lot of IBM mainframes or a lot of SQL servers on-prem, anything like that. So I think that like securing the cloud, which is a whole different thing than securing an on-prem environment, is really uh, something that people need to pay attention to in the future. And I can speak firsthand from saying there's a huge, I don't think there's a huge shortage of cybersecurity professionals in the industry. I think there's a shortage of people that understand cloud security because uh, you may have worked in cybersecurity for the past 30 years, but your job was really patching that one SQL server in the office, and that's the aspect of cybersecurity you worked on. Uh, when you have an architecture that's in the cloud, it's a much more of a high-level overview of what you're working on because a lot of the controls are already in place because you don't technically own them, AWS or Google or someone else does. And so you have to look more around processes and, and stuff like that. So cloud security, really big, and really trying to find people to to fill that talent gap because there's not enough there right now, I think are, are some things that are fo- that I'm focused on really. And, and that security is going to be changing over the next few years. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I actually have a friend. Uh, I've known him for several years at this point. And I was telling him, you know, back in like 2017, 2018, Hey, you need to get into the cloud, you know, get, Get the basic AWS foundations, Azure foundations certification, at least know the vocabulary, like, you know, because everything is going to the cloud and it's going to transform how we do everything. And recently, you know, he he kind of put it off and everything else like that, right? Didn't think it was that, you know, important or urgent for him to do that, right? And so recently he got onto a phone call with the rest of his team and they started talking about AWS a lot more, right? Because their company is moving towards AWS and they're providing, you know, consulting services towards um, customers in the cloud and things like that. And he said he didn't understand a single minute of this hour long conversation. (laughs) He said it sounded like they were just talking a foreign language. They had words that he had never heard before or anything like that. And that's very true. You know, and now I am, I'm studying to actually you know, retake or re up my AWS security cert. Right. And it's, uh, it's insane how the vocabulary changes just from three years. 
right? Three years ago, I took it, passed the cert, got it. I understood, you know, the majority of the content on there, obviously, but there wasn't ever like a, a vocab word, so to speak, that I didn't know what it was. Um, and then I, you know, I go back and I'm trying to like, prepare for this new exam. This year. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, I'm I'm like from square zero again, you know, like what is going on here? Did that much stuff change in the last three years that we have? I mean, it's literally like a hundred new words, you know, that you need to know what they are. And I'm sitting here like, did I select English for the <laughs> the test? Like you know, did I accidentally select German? Because this is this is insane. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that a couple of things that like cloud and, and technology in general just moves fast, but cloud moves really fast. Um, I also think that when you look at like the testing that you were taking, I think that a lot of times the vocabulary and just kind of the way that they articulate things in tests, they've tried to make them more in what they view sophisticated or challenging. So it may not be, it's, it may be the same test just with different words that they've just recently made up to fulfill that test. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that it's, it's again, I, I love technology for all the acronyms and all the weird words that it has in it. And what and I think that like really the, the actual changes over the past years that you've seen, especially from three years ago in your certification with AWS, they probably haven't dramatically changed. I would say that there has been some changes. Again, to your point, there was 40 releases last year. They do have some changes, but I would say that the majority of what you're dealing with is probably the semantics and the test and how they've phrased and worded, worded things to make it more confusing and make it more challenging for people. To yeah, you, you know what it is, is they added, you know, they they didn't add that much brand new capability, right? What they did is they took existing capability and then they delineated it even further, right? So, you you know, cloud formation has been around for a long time. You know, know. if I you don't just know, people, AWS, it's like, just move your server out of your room and then it's right. in the cloud. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you don't know cloud formation, you're probably not in AWS. You don't understand, you know, anything in the, in the cloud, right? Okay. So I got that down. And now when I go and take the test, there's like five or six new cloud formation dash something service that does a, you know, a smaller component of cloud formation. And that's all it does. But it's not like you can just look at it and know what it does because you know the functionality of cloud formation you know like they have some weird lingo with it that now it's like okay i need to learn this stupid vocab word that you know does this thing that i've been doing for five years <laughs> you know like, have to pay them to learn more about this and to do it so yeah. i think it's, it's capitalism <laughs> it's really yeah, it yeah. yeah how can we how can we get the most from our customers <laughs> For exactly. this one thing, yep, that is. It's, the truth. it's a it's a it's a very good point. You know how do you how do you recommend people learn the cloud, right? And it, it sounds like a very straightforward answer, right? But it's not that straightforward because if you go into AWS for just talking about AWS because that's the most I'm the most familiar with AWS, right? If we're talking about learning AWS, the first instinct is to go in AWS, create an account, start getting up, you know, some infrastructure or whatnot using that quote unquote free tier, right? I can't tell you how many times I've started a free tier account and deployed only free tier assets to find out I had a $300 bill, you <laughs> know, six free, months guys. later. It's, it's right. Not free. I can't even tell you the amount of times. Um, you know, recently, I guess relatively recently, I've dove more into the cloud guru space, right? Because you can learn about different topics. They have a sandbox environment set up right there for you. You don't have to worry about getting that random, you know, $300, $400 bill six months down the line that you didn't even know uh, was running in the environment, right? So how do you recommend people learn it best and quickest? So I think this is a really tough question and it's something that we've struggled with at Remedic because again, this is relatively new. I don't have a huge pool of talent to pick from. So we have to train a lot of our staff in house. 
And a lot of people, everyone learns differently. Like I always tell everyone, and one of the things I ask people during the interview is, how do you learn? Like I'm a visual learner. I have to see something or I have to experience it to really understand it in a different way. And so I think that it's really up to that person um, and how best they learn. Are they going to need to, or do we need to set up an, a, a test account for them and let them play around in it and understand it? Do they need to just go get the standard certifications that they get because they'll just read it and retain it and they'll know it? Um, do they need to work with one of our more senior people and learn off of them? There's just different ways for everyone to learn. And I think that it's not standard across the board. I wish there was like one sort of security sort of standardized testing that we could just put everyone through and be like, once you've graduated this, you're ready to go. You'll start working with rheumatic customers. And it's not that simple. It really is something where we have to kind of customize training for each one because we also hire people that come in with different levels of skill set. Um, and so we have to kind of customize training for each one of those people. And um, that's been something for us, frankly, that's been one of the biggest issues we've had, especially over, let's say, the past five years, because we've gone through ultimately hyper growth. We've been adding numerous customers every single month, um, was to find talent, train talent, and retain talent and keep them here. We, we can, we always keep people here. We don't actually lose them, but like find them and train them. And through that training process, realize that like they want to stay here. They want to work in tech. And so then, and, and then they will. Um, but I think part of it is too, is like, it's everyone will learn differently. So they need to understand how they learn and they have to have a really a desire or interest to work in technology because then they're not going to care as much. They're not going to try as hard. They're not going to be as, as invested as if they don't care if they're like, Oh, I took this job because I just needed a job or I, this was just something that I thought paid well and it wasn't necessarily like aligns with my interests. Um, then they're not going to really learn it because they're not going to have a passion for it. So I think when we look for people that we want to bring on board at Remedic and train them, we want to understand that they know how they learn. Um, because then we can customize training for them. Um, and we want to understand if they have a passion for security and technology. And if they do, then we can typically um, bring them on board and train them uh, as they need to learn. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's fascinating, you know, that you put it that way, right? Because I feel like a lot of companies are looking for you to be the expert day one. You know, and they're they're kind of looking for that unicorn and then they don't pay unicorn money, you know, and it's like, guys, you know, if you want me to be a unicorn and I'm not a unicorn right now, you know, you need to be able to train me up, right, to get to that level. And it's really refreshing to hear you say that. I've actually only heard maybe one other person or executive overall, you know, actually say that and practice it. And that's actually how I got my start in it overall, you know, this guy literally took me from nothing. You know, I could spell Linux, but I, God forbid I had to, you know, look at a terminal, you know, like I, I could not, I could not figure it out for the life of me. And he was very patient, you know, had great training resources around me and, you know, told me like, Hey, if I give you all these resources and you still don't make it, maybe it isn't the thing for you. But I think that it is. And if you keep on learning, you keep on pushing yourself, you keep investigating this thing, it's going to work out, you know, and I believe that it will. Right. That's all that I needed in that situation and in that part of my life to really, you know, kind of dive in and, you know, become what I became today. Right. Um, it's it's really refreshing to hear that because <laughs> there's a lot of people out there that do not have that same mentality, but they'll complain about the shortage in security. Well, then how are you going to fix it? Are you just going to keep complaining right. about it and expect it just to automatically change? Or are you going to do something to try to fix that problem for your business yourself? And I tend to veer towards the audience too, because I don't know to do it. Frankly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I used to work for a credit bureau and, uh, you know, they had maybe the best pipeline I've ever seen where, you know, they had regular IT help desk people. And if they expressed an interest in security, you know, there was a very specific team that they went to. Like, these are the people that are basically just IT support for security situations. And from there, all the other teams under the security umbrella 
would start, you know, identifying their strengths, their weaknesses, and they would actually actively recruit and try and poach people from this team. And that that team's manager, I'm, I'm good friends with him to this day. And he, he said, like, yeah, it's great for, you know, the people on my team. It is absolutely horrible for my team because we're constantly rotating people, you know, nice all the time. It's like, <laughs> yeah, he's, into cyber, cyber security, huh? Yeah, he's, he's like, you know, I'm over here with 30 people on my team, like on a good day, you know, next week I'm losing two people. Well, I got to replace those two people. Like, you know, my workload doesn't end just because some other team needs them, you know. But it, it was a great uh, it was a great environment, great pipeline, you know, because you could go down a rabbit hole and you could say, you know, maybe six months in. Oh, you know what? I don't think that this thing is for me. Maybe the offensive side of security is more for me. And there was, you know, five, six teams under the offensive side. So one of them would say, OK, come and work for us for six months, you know, and it's not a big deal. Right. Um, it, it was a fantastic way to kind of get started in cybersecurity, I felt. Yeah. Now, for the same, I mean, I don't, I'm not as probably as big as that company was. I don't have huge departments in every different aspect of cybersecurity, but <laughs> yeah. uh, I always tell all of my employees that again, when we come, they come here and we train them. And I'm like, I, part of what I get fulfillment of working with is having employees, and giving, not just having them work here, to them check but develop their skills, develop who they are, human beings. Those are the things that can make me feel proud. And so when I'm interviewing people to come work here, I will frankly tell them I'll be like, this is the role that we have you in, but like we are growing tremendously fast. So I don't want you to think that you're going to be pigeonholed into this. If you come here and you are also on the side doing some other learning into something else and you realize like you want to be a pen tester. That's someplace I can place it pretty easily. But if there's other aspects within the industry that you want to work in and there's an opportunity for us to build out a, a line of business around that, we're talking about doing managed detection response actually as a service we're going to be adding this year. So if there are people that are interested in working as like a SOC analyst, um, there's absolutely that opportunity to kind of grow and learn with the company. And so, um, yeah, I think it's important to be able to hire people and then let them know that like, I want you to grow. I want you to continue to grow with the company. And I think kind of to the point you had before where you said your friend was losing people all the time, I get that there's always churn. Um, I've recognized that from the start with Remedic and I want my employees to always feel very appreciated here. So we're a startup, we're a bootstrap startup. So I don't know that we, like, I, I can't offer equity to my employees or anything like that because it's just mm. the company is never going to be worth $150 million for them to you know, make them worth it. Right. Um, but I make sure that we, we have really competitive salaries in terms of where we're at. Um, we offer really good benefits. And we do a lot of offsites where I fly the whole company together and just show them that they're appreciated because I realize that like once you learn this skill, you will be poached because there is such a shortage of talent in the industry. And so I want my employees to really feel appreciated for working here. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's extremely, extremely important. You, you know, I, I can't tell you the amount of times that I've worked for a company and, you know, you just feel like a number, <laughs> you know, you just feel like, you know, no one even knows that you're there. And then when layoffs are happening, you're, you're really just trying to, you know, make sure that yes, you're online, but you're not talking to anyone. You're trying to make sure that people forget about you. And, you know, it's a, it's a mess. It's, it's not a good situation to be in. And I, I've always felt like the companies that really excel are the companies that actually truly care about their people, you know, and you can see that, you know, it, you can see that in the pay, you can see that in the retirement benefits, right? You could see that in the healthcare um, I've never felt more underappreciated than when I get poor healthcare benefits, right? It's like, man, these guys, these guys are like really don't care, <laughs> you know? Because we, I, th I feel the same way, and because of that, we pay for our employees and our employees' family and stuff one hundred percent. So, because I realize that, and, and again, we're not a huge company with a ton of funding, but I realize that like that's a good, like I don't want my employees to ever have to stress out about like medical bills. Yeah, um, you have a you have a job here, and I want you to be able to feel like you can focus on that. And so, any way that I can alleviate other stresses in your life that you may have, um, so that you're able to focus more on your job and overall just be a happier person, I, I want to do that. And I think when I think about like healthcare um, and and just the entire healthcare industry, it's it's I don't want anyone to have to 
any of my employees have to go to the hospital and then be like, oh man, I owe a hundred thousand dollars to this hospital. Now I'm super stuck. Like that just doesn't, yeah. I, I, if there's something I can do to make one of the rheumatic employees not have to deal with that, I, I 100% want. Yeah. I, I feel like, um, I feel like we could have a whole other podcast about the healthcare system and <laughs> how, you know, like how, how you can go to a hospital because you're dying right? You get the life-saving treatment and then you're hit with a $200,000 bill. You know, it, it's... Uh, and have to be also poor because they have to pay for all of their bills. It seems awful. Right. You know, it's uh, it's not it's not fair. That's not how this should be working. <laughs> you know, like my, uh, quick story, right? Because I want to talk about Remedic. Um, but quick side story, right? I, I grew up fairly poor. My family was pretty poor. Um, of course, growing up in that situation, you don't you don't think you're poor, you don't identify with that or anything like that. But we were right. And one day my sister got really sick. She went to the hospital, found out her kidneys were failing. Right. She's like 12 years old at this time. Immediately, you know, through throughout throughout everything that she goes through, got a got a kidney transplant and everything like that. Right. At the end of it, it was something like four hundred thousand dollars. How in the world? Could anyone ever pay for that? And just to keep their to kid feel alive. Like they can they can begin to think about even how having to pay about right. like I, and I that's just to keep their kid with, alive, you know? Yeah. I also didn't grow up with with really any I, I wasn't poor, but I would say I was I was I didn't to your point I didn't know that I was poor. Um but I didn't grow up with a lot. And so I, I and I didn't really even have much until I started rheumatic, honestly. I was I was very much paycheck to paycheck. And like the idea of having a four hundred thousand dollar burden on of healthcare burden is just would be at that point in time for me would have been so deflating that I wouldn't even have known how to start to deal with that because it's like I I'm never going to get on top of this so like yeah. what how do I even try and so yeah, yeah. I, I just I think again it's as as someone who is an employer it is my responsibility unfortunately it's my responsibility to have to do these things for my employees because I want the best out of them and I want them to appreciate their jobs and appreciate working here. And so I want to make, take all of those sort of like things that I can control, all of the stresses that I can control. I want to do my best to get those out of their lives so that they can focus on work and they can enjoy working here and feel like they're valued. Absolutely. You know, let's, let's talk about Remedic, you know, so let's just start, you know, kind of from the beginning, it sounds like, you guys offer a lot of different services that are, you know, to be quite honest, pretty critical in the security space, mm -hmm. right? So let, let's talk about, you know, what you guys offer, what the areas of specialty uh, you guys offer in the industry and things like that. Yeah. So um, when I started the company, like I said, uh, when I was working for that law firm and then they referred me to their clients. So I was just doing pen testing at that point in time. So it was just pen testing. Um, and we were, and that's still kind of the heart of who we are. We, we provide amazing pen tests. I'm really proud of the work that we do. Um, and I was doing pen tests for a lot of larger businesses. And then, like I said, I wanted to kind of adopt working with smaller businesses. And then I went on to do a lot of work pen tests where we would do OWASP or OSP pen tests or PCI scans, things like that. Um, so there's the whole sort of like pen testing kind of aspect of the business. Um, and then we do, um, we work with a lot of like those compliance platforms that I mentioned out there because we leverage those as kind of, we use them for compliance and to fulfill some of the controls that you need, but more are, times than not, we use them as the baseline, as like the foundation of your security program and the source of truth. Um, but we leverage those platforms and then we build and manage InfoSec and data privacy programs for our customers. So we typically take those platforms, leverage those as the baseline and the source of truth to conduct risk assessments. And then based upon the risk assessment that we've conducted for our customers, we build a robust security program and then we continue to manage it. And that's our CISO as a service offering, um, which is kind of, it's, it's, it's now the biggest aspect of the business, but it's, as part of that, we offer pen tests every year. We work our sort of offensive security program into their, into their program, uh, into the security program for them. And it's been great. I mean, there's a lot of companies out there that will hire us uh, to build the program for them. And then they grow. And we actually typically don't lose customers, even when they get big enough and they hire a CISO themselves. 
uh, because they still need to leverage us for some of the things that if you're a CISO, you're probably not wanting to do an access review every quarter, or <laughs> you don't want to go and, and, and review your policies, things like that. So they'll, they'll still kind of leverage us when they get to a larger point for some of the more administrative stuff. Um, but yeah, the CISO as a service is really kind of the foundation and the rock of our business. And that's, that's, it, it, it for me allows me to have, cause again, we're bootstrapped reoccurring revenue so I can forecast the growth of the business and I can scale accordingly, which is part of the reason I needed that sort of monthly retainer. Cause with Pentest, it was just an up and down payment sort of thing. Um, and so that's, that's a big piece of it. And then we do other things too. Um, so if you're going to be, uh, we're not an audit firm. I don't want to be an audit firm. Um, but if you want to get ISO 27, any ISO compliant framework compliant, you have to do what's called an internal audit. Um, which is almost like a pre audit before you do your audit with the certifying body to make sure that you're ready to go into it. Um, and the person that does that or the company that does that needs to be an independent third party. So if you built the program, you can't also do the internal audit because you're just auditing what you built yourself. Um, and so that's another aspect of the business that we, we have as well. So it's really kind of centered around providing all of the services that you need to, in terms of like an offensive security program, pen testing, scans, all of that stuff. Uh, code reviews, everything there, um, around administrative and operational aspects of building the program, which is kind of the CISO as a service area of it as well. So we combine both of those to kind of create a robust security program offering for our customer. Hmm. Wow. That, that is, uh, that's really fascinating. You know, it sounds like from, from my opinion, right? It sounds like you kind of approach the virtual CISO role from a different angle. Um, or at least, you know, from an angle that I never heard of or thought of before is, you know, kind of offloading those tasks to some extent that, you know, kind of every security department as a whole, you know, kind of, kind of doesn't want to do, <laughs> you know, like the access reviews, right? I, I've never talked to a IAM manager or an IT manager overall and, you know, heard that they want to do access reviews and that they're excited for it to to identify all of the, you know, misusage of roles and accounts and groups <laughs> in their environment, right? Um, it, it's a really interesting uh, take on it that I think a lot of companies would actually benefit from, you know, a, a great deal, right? Like, is that what you're seeing as well? Like, how did yeah. you even, how did you even think of taking that spin on it? Or maybe it's just a native virtual CISO, you know, uh, functionality or feature that I just didn't know about. So when I decided to kind of work with smaller SaaS based businesses, so again, we were just doing pen tests through about 2017, mostly big businesses in New York and, um, two, two folds. One, I wanted to work with the future of technology, which I thought was cloud and is, which I was right. Um, and I also, um, again, since I told you I didn't come from like, I didn't come from a lot of money. I was doing these pen tests where I would get a pay paycheck and then there would be nothing for two months. And then I'd get a paycheck and nothing for two months. And I was like, I need some stability in my income to continue. That's how I just have to live because I'm not used to big paychecks and then peaks and valleys. And so by doing that, I would go to the smaller businesses and I would offer them pen tests. And typically startups didn't always have a lot of capital to pay for a, a pen test in one payment. So I let them spread that out over like a couple of months. During that time period that they were paying me, they would come to me for tons of other services because there was no one else that could help them with this sort mm. of stuff. And so that's, I kind of started to take all of that data in about what the services were that all these customers were asking us for. And then I realized that like, that's the program that I need to build as a CISO as a service type of program that's based for these sort of cloud-based companies. And so again, when you're looking at their architecture or something like that, yeah, you can do so. We have people that do some terraforming stuff like that here. Um, but overall, a lot of the work that you're doing is more administrative because all of the controls and things are built in, or you're just putting in, sneak or you're putting in some sort of like intrusion detection system or you're, you're monitoring that or managing that. But um, it just became more like taking everything that everyone wanted and then looking at the holes in the industry and then building a program out over that. So I didn't have this like early on, I thought I would just do pen tests. I didn't have this early on idea of like, okay, it's, I'm going to do CISO as a service and this is exactly what it looked like. I really just looked at what the opportunities were in the industry. I analyzed that and then I followed that and I built programs out to, to make what we have today. Hmm. That's really fascinating. It's always interesting for me to see how everything kind of comes together and, 
you know, where, where different ideas come from. Right. Because it kind of, kind of also influences, you know, how I make my own decisions and how I view different things. Right. Like I start to get into that mentality of, Oh, maybe I could dive into this a little bit more and offer it, you know, a different way and whatnot. So it's always, it's always fascinating. Well, Justin, you know, our conversation has been fantastic. You know, I really enjoyed talking with you today. Um, unfortunately, we're at the top of our time here. Um, you know, but before I let you go, how about you tell my audience, you know, where they can find you, where they can find Remedic, if they wanted to reach out and learn more. Sure. You can just, um, our website is www.remedic.com and that's R-H-Y-M-E-T-E-C.com. Or feel free to just email me. It's um, Justin, J-U-S-T-I-N dot Rendy, R-E-N-D-E at Remedic.com. And I'm happy to answer any questions or help any of your listeners in any way I can. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode.